Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversations are pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Did you bring your thinking caps? Because it's time to put them on. Because the conversation starts now. Thanks, Constance. That helps me be in the room with you. And it's real important that I'm in the room with you so I can feel your vibe here on the edge. Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains here. Look, that's the spot. The place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. We have Constant Woolard today, and we're going to talk to her about a lot of things. I can't wait to uh, talk to her, because if you see her brains, you're going to know she's everywhere. I mean, all over social media. Uh, she's been speaking on stages. She's really a trailblazer, originally from the nursing profession, and thank you so much for that in advance, because nurses and teachers are my favorite people on the planet. But we're going to talk a little bit about self-limiting beliefs and how we sabotage ourselves, but also how we do it at a young age. She has um, overcome some childhood obesity, and we're going to talk about that too, because I still think I'm a kid and I'm obese. <laughs> so she's going to help me kind of frame that and reframe that and get my head around it because uh, I'm working on it. So thank you so much, Constance, for being on the edge with me. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about your story and your struggle with weight at a young age. Okay. I am a native of Gulfport, Mississippi, and I struggled with obesity from the age of three until the age of 47. Wow. And it was a lifelong struggle for me. I've been on every diet out there that you can name, from Weight Watchers, Scarsdale, Keto. I can tell you about it. I lost the weight, but I was never able to sustain it. And I was not able to sustain the weight because I had not dealt with the triggers within and the real issues that led to the weight. At three so years for old, me, you had, I'm, I'm sorry to interject, but at three years old, you had issues? Yes, because for three years old, I entered into kindergarten. The kids were very mean and they were rude and they were nasty and they picked at me mm. and made fun of me because I was overweight. They said all kinds of little nasty things to me. Um, some of them would not play with me because I was overweight. They just never had anything good to say. So at an early age, I began to develop a sabotaging behavior of mistrust. Mm. I didn't trust anybody because I wasn't, I was, you know, unaware of how they would receive me, how they would treat me. So I developed mistrust mm. at a very early age. Very early. That's awful. So in your household, did you have siblings? I had no siblings. I'm an only child. Um, both parents were in the home, very loving, very supportive. But the difference for me was my mom had never been overweight. So she didn't understand my struggle. Mm. She did not know how to support me because she had never lived that. And so she would say to me, well, you need to lose weight, baby. Okay. I agree with that. But the next 30 minutes, make a pan of brownies and call me in the kitchen to indulge in those brownies or whatever else it was that I enjoyed that she fixed or prepared. Mm -hmm. And so this went on through elementary school. This went on through junior high, but the sabotaging behaviors really set in high school because I was not invited to the prom. I didn't go to the prom, overweight. Mm -hmm. I go off to college. I spend four years on a college campus never went on a date the whole time I was there. Why? Nobody wants to date the fat girl. Well, that was back then, because I'm that telling was you, back they, then. They, look at, they looking for the fluffy sisters now, okay? They, okay. Want, they want all that. I mean, you look at young women like Lizzo. I was just talking about that. They mm -hmm. like it as thick as they can get it. But yes. I can imagine, I had a friend 
when I was in elementary school, and her name was Tonette, and she was real heavy, and the kids made fun of her, and she had a medical condition. And I made it a, that's why she gained weight. Her medicines were steroids. And um, the kids were so mad, and she had the prettiest face. And when you sat down and laughed and talked to her, she was a great storyteller. They just don't give you a chance. And kids are cruel. They are really, really cruel. And finding food and comfort. Culturally, on the flip side, you see a lot of other young women go to the extreme where they starve themselves. Yes. Where they have bulimia and anorexia and they don't feel that they're worthy of food and they punish themselves. It's a whole psychological head trip. How did you finally get your head around it to be able to lose the weight? Okay. So let me say this, you know, with the you're right. I found comfort in food. That was my friend. That was my comfort. And so I found comfort in food and so I, I ate and I ate and I ate. My parents had the food available. No one stopped me. Uh, I was not restricted. Whenever I wanted something, I had the freedom to go and get it. But what changed it for me, I witnessed my father suffer two massive strokes within two weeks of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what that did to him. And I said to myself right then, I can't go out like this. I've got too much living to do. You've got to make a change right here today because diabetes is on both sides of the family. Hypertension and heart disease is on both sides of the family. So I had to make a change, but I had to realize some things about myself. I love to eat, I like good food, and I hate to be restricted. That's why the diets didn't work. I was stay on them for a little while, but I hate to be restricted. So I had to come up with a strategy that was going to work for me. Now, if you look at the average size plate in our homes, they're seven inches. That's too much food. So I bought smaller plates. I bought four and a half to five inch plates. If you go to a restaurant, it's a nine inch plate, especially Olive Garden, too much food. Girl, and, and the cheese. Yes. I'm just like, I don't know how this is even going to make it down to the mm -hmm. plan. It mm -hmm. is so much. And they give you, I guess they're trying to give you value. But here in the United States, it's just way, it's too, way much. too much. It's too much. You and so. Breakfast and me and my husband split a plate. Is that much mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I ordered the lunch size portions and they're still too big. They are big. They you are know, big. I could eat off of them for three days, a lunch size portion from Olive Garden. Mm -hmm. And I well, love. I do, a, I do a, a bowl. I do that now because the bowl is the same size as my stomach. Okay. And if it is full, then it's full. Mm -hmm. But okay. there's so many steps, and you know, you from your nursing background too. Maybe you can help me with that. Just some basic things, brains. I want you to think about this on your weight management journey. I don't want to call it a diet. I want to call it a live it. Because that's what we're doing. We're trying to live through it. But you know what they don't consider? And this is so annoying. When you start this journey, you got to get rid of the bloat. Yes. You forget how yes. much bloat and inflammation is in there. Yes. You got to yes. get before you can even attack the weight, before you can even break a sweat. You got to have, you know, your circadian rhythm down where you mm -hmm. are sleeping at night. Just that alone, I lost five pounds. Okay. I wasn't eating. I was on this. Um, so after you get rid of the bloat, okay, then before you can even break a sweat. And it is about, for me, getting the weight under control with the food. Looking at my plate, making sure there's plenty of color, fruits and vegetables. Me and my husband went out and instead of eating candy yams, now I make sweet potatoes. Uh, like mashed potatoes. Girl, put just a little bit of sugar. And, you know, it takes a ton of sugar out of the product. But it's equally as good. you got to be smart with that. Then eliminating. You know, a lot of women don't eliminate every day. I'm to the point where I can do two and be comfortable. It's that bloat. And then you start to lose the weight. But let me ask you this. When you got through all of that, 
and you looked at your body and you saw how much weight you had and your self-esteem and your, you know, your face got thinner and your neck got thinner. Did you go through a head trip? Yes, I did. Because when I looked in the mirror, I still saw a heavy person. Wow. Yeah. So I bought my clothes too big. And I will never forget, I went to a store one day and I picked up some things and the lady said, that's cute, but that's, that's too big for you. And I said, oh, no, it's not. She said, yes, it is. And so I got it back to the hotel and tried it on. And yes, it was too big. And I said, well, I can't go back tomorrow because she's working tomorrow. I don't want her to see. I had to bring it back. I said, so I'll wait till the next day that evening. She'll be off. Well, she worked that day. Then when I walked in the door, she saw me. She said, I told you. Yeah, it was, it was too, too big. big. Yeah, but she said, I told you. Yeah. But, okay, now you said something very pivotal right there. You were looking for validation from an outside source to collaborate with you with exactly. the inside. Exactly. So again, it was it was beyond just the physical weight and the food. It was about being accepted and wanted. Did I get that right? right? You definitely did. You definitely did. But for me, you know, one thing I want to piggyback on when we talk about the sabotaging behaviors, for me growing up to counteract the negativity, I became an overachiever. So mm-hmm. I excelled at academics. I excelled at music. I excelled at everything. So my parents thought I was okay. Mm-hmm. When really I was not. You know, they thought, you know, she's a straight A student, she's a good student, she's doing this, she's doing that. She's okay. But I really was not. And most children do not want their parents to know that they're going through something like that. And they don't know they how don't. To, they don't know how to explain it. Yeah. You know, without formal training and you know, because again. Food is comforting. It makes mm-hmm. you happy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, all your family you know, functions around on, food. Let's go, yeah, come on, baby. Let's have some cookies and milk. It's okay. Or, you know, let's go have a pie. Let's go have some ice cream. Mm-hmm. And then it, it turns into a snowball effect. Yes. And so, you know, I looked at, you know, I, I cut my portions. So what I did was, if it didn't fit on that four and a half inch to five inch plate, I didn't eat it. Now, it took me about five months to get over wanting to overeat because mm-hmm. I've been doing it for so long. So I would fix my plate, I would eat, I clean my kitchen, and I'd run upstairs and stay all night because if I came back downstairs, I was going to eat, and I knew that. So I hid in my room all night until the next day so I wouldn't overeat. And it took me five months to get over that desire. But after you did that, you also set up your body for what is very popular now is intermittent fasting. Yes, yes, yes. And so I still, it's been 12 years later, I still eat that way. I cut my portions, I eat whatever I want to eat, but I cut my portions. And so when I first started this, my son and I, we would go out to eat. He would order dessert, I'd get a dessert, and then we'd bring one home. Mm Mm-hmm. So we stopped bringing one home, we get one dessert, and we would split it, the two of us, because he went on the diet with me. Mm. And he was only 10 years old. And so we started split, splitting the dessert, and then we got to a point where we would start taking that one dessert, cut it in half, box one half, and then we split the half. Well, I, you know, I did that today. I made... um. Some Japanese curry. I had never made it before. Girl, I about ate myself to death. (laughs) (laughs) And you know what I did? I really kind of extracted the meat because the sauce was so flavorable. I didn't miss the meat. Instead of, you know, usually on a bed of rice, I put the rice on top. And I only used a little bit of it. Okay. I did treat myself. I got me one of them little tiny. It's an apple pie about this big. And a scoop of ice cream. But I'm just as happy. And when Mr. Magnificent comes home, I'll have a little bit of dinner with him. And after that, I'm done. I tell myself I am done. I was messing up myself because I would be up talking to clients all over the world. Three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Well, that was breakfast time for me. And then I beat up forgot that I ate about nine. And then mm-hmm. I'd be one, well, let me have lunch and breads and carbs. I was looking at yes. how easy it was for me to have five to six pieces of bread a day. 
you know, a bagel in the morning, uh, bread with my sandwich, a dinner roll. That's five pieces of bread. Yes. And it's and too much. Know, yeah. And you it's know, too much. And drinking your calories, girl, on them refills. Mm -hmm. They'll give you, you know, and check out in your bill brains how much it is just for a beverage, just like $4 or $5 yes. dollars, just for a drink. But yeah, they don't continuously give you refills, but you can make a thing of Kool-Aid for, you know, a buck fifty. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it's the little things that you really don't think about that you can extract before you have to go on these extreme diets. Now, you were overweight. You, did you have any sort of type of surgery? Did you ever consider gastric? No, I thought about it, but I did not. I, that was that was my last resort. Mm -hmm. um, but this method has worked for me. And like I said, I'm, I'm entering year 12. I went from a size 24. I now wear a size 6, 8. Wow. Wow. Yes. Yes. So you got the weight under control, and then did you exercise? Because when I exercised when I first started. When I first started, because my routine, I didn't have an exercise routine at all in my life. I would go to work, come home, eat, get on the couch, go to bed. That was it. So I incorporated exercise. I went to the gym. I invested in a trainer, and I did that for about 12 weeks, and I started going to the gym, started working out. So that helped a lot just getting the exercise in. Um, started drinking more water. Oh, good. Water yep. is my best friend. You know, and this that's another thing, Brains, that I have uh, discovered, <clears throat> uh, and Constance, is that if you drink a sweet drink, be it a soda or a juice or whatever, and you go back and get two or three refills, baby, you, you're not quenching your thirst. No. You're no. not quenching your thirst. The only thing that quenches your thirst, this and, you know, maybe a good mojito, but <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part is <sighs> water. There's nothing like water. Nothing like water. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. And I love it and I add a little fresh fruit to mine. I love it. I do too. I do too. Love it. So yeah. now cooking, when you also go grocery shopping, Brains, you hear this all the time. Shop the outer perimeter of the store. Don't go up and down the aisles because that's where all the processed stuff is. It's where you find the chips and the crackers and the cookies and the, you know, get you some fresh collard greens and cook them instead of the ones that are processed in the can. You know, they're I, not good anyway. They're, they're not, not good. good. They're not no. good. And teach your children how to eat properly. This gets on my nerve in a way. Now, I understand everybody's got preferences and choices because I hate okra. And my mother, to the day she died, wanted me to eat okra and I can't stand it. But allowing, not uh, incorporating a balanced diet, there are things that your children like. You can't tell me that they don't like, you know, peas and greens and, you know, maybe you're not preparing them right. But give them an option. Reward them for trying new foods. Bring them in the kitchen with you. Grow a garden and let them know yes. where the food is coming from. Those That's number kind of one there. Are really going to help them understand and appreciate what they're eating. Would you mm -hmm. agree? The gardening is number one. I, I, I tell everybody, if you have some space in your backyard, if you got some pots, teach children about growing vegetables because they learn to appreciate where food comes from and what the importance of it is to our body. So I tell anyone, if you got some space, have a garden. Mm -hmm. Teach children how to garden. Teach them, it's very important. So you got over the sabotage, self-sabotage, and you said, you know what? I'm not gonna have this conversation in my head anymore. I'm going to know better. I'm gonna do better. I'm in the healthcare industry. I see what's going on. And I look around sometimes. And am I judging? Yes, Brains, I'm judging, because we all do. When you're telling me a story, if you say you don't, that's the only way that you can edit and filter information. But I look, and I see how many obese people are in the United States. It's, you know, they may be small in some places, but they got a big protruding belly, or, you know, they're, they're hippie, or you, they're not able to walk, or, uh, you know, just a lot of things are going on. But when I travel other countries... I don't see that. And like you said, it's the clean eating and it's the portion control. They don't eat sugar like we eat sugar. They don't, uh, you know, they'll go for a walk like in Italy. 
You know, after you have gelato, everybody goes for a community walk. It's it's just different. And it's the food here. Do you think the food here is poisoning us a little bit? I think so. It's the additives. We don't know what they're adding to the stuff. Nope. We don't. And so, and I think that's why our children, especially our young girls, are maturing faster because of the hormones they're injecting into the meats. Yep. And the additives. You know, when I was growing up, we didn't hear about um, adult attention deficit disorder. We didn't hear about that. Now it's widespread and it's from the additives in the foods. Mm, mm, mm. It really is. And so I encourage parents, instead of buying whole homogenized milk for your child, organic milk. You know, with my son has attention deficit disorder when I was working with him because I didn't want him on the medications. It wasn't doing him any good. And so I did some research and I found that organic foods such as organic milk is better for and to treat that disorder. And that really helped him. He stayed on that diet for about three months and I can see a difference. Wow. In his behavior and his attention span. So parents get out, read, you know, if you have a WIC office near you, a home county extension office, health department, get information on how to prepare healthy food choices for your children. It's very well, important. And for yourself. Yeah, but I mean, we have to take into consideration that there are certain segments of the population that don't even have grocery stores in their immediate community. And that's why it is imperative to teach them about growing. You can get regular old flower pots. Uh, you can use an egg carton to start growing plants. You can do boxes. a lot. Exactly. Boxes. Boxes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you would be amazed at um, how fascinated children are by that. And then they get excited to eat the fruit of their labor. They yes. The fruit of their labor. You wrote a book. You're part of an uh, anthology, correct? I've done six anthologies thus far. Wow. And now I have my own. I'm the visionary. This is my first time as the visionary. I'm doing one called The Invisible Soul. And what The Invisible Soul about is my struggle with feeling invisible as an obese teenager and young adult because I felt invisible. And so the anthology is embracing anyone who at some point in their lives have felt invisible, unnoticed, discriminated against, victimized, your voice has been taken from you. That's what I'm looking for as co-authors for this collaboration. Wow, that's amazing um, because you have to talk about it. Yes, but you have it's a healing process. You're not alone. Yeah, you got to know that you're not alone. And everybody's got something. Some yes. Some scars are just visible on the outside, but inside. So you fell in love, obviously, because you have a son. How did that, how did that make you feel to be able to come into your own, to find intimacy, to find beauty, and then share that with another individual? Well, when I had my son, I was obese. My son's father and I worked together and we were best friends and actually we become friends again. Now we're best of friends now. Um, but, you know, even though he married someone else, we're still best of friends and we still collaborate. My son is 23 and we still talk probably every week because we have that son. So we've come to the realization that we are connected for life regardless of what happens. Um, but as far as finding intimacy, that's not even what my focus was after I lost the weight. Mm. It was all about finding me, finding out more, because I always knew who I was, but finding out more about me and showing the world about me. I've always known who I was. I've always known that I was strong, that I you know, had abilities to do things, but it was more of me coming into my own and telling the world about me. Right. And what I have to offer and what I represent. So, you know, at one time in my life, I'll say when I was 25 and I get ready to in, break off into something where, you know, you can't do that. You're too heavy and you're not going to be receiving. And, you know, all those sabotaging behaviors in your mind. Now, you can't you tell, tell me. <laughs> you can't tell me I'm not the baddest witch would it be right now. Mm -mm -mm. You can't tell me when I walk in that boardroom on Monday morning, I own it. 
the atmosphere here shifts. That's right. Because I know who I am and I know whose I am. But how did you get and that's what my platform is all about? How Helping did you gain people to that command? Who they are. Right, but how did you how did you how'd you gain that? I mean, you just woke up one morning and said, Shazam. You know, what were the processes? What were the stepping stones? Because you're talking to a young person right now that's right uh-huh. now, that's full five hundred pounds, you know, and they're saying, Nope, you know what? And they probably feeding the giant as you're talking. What would you say to that person right now? Daily affirmations. Mm. To this day, I write myself affirmations out every day and I have them posted all around my bathroom mirror and I read them every day and I have some from years ago. Mm. I still read them. Affirmations, learning to affirm within yourself that you are worthy. And that you deserve what this life has to offer. You know, my focus this year is becoming fabulous in 2022. And the letter A of the word fabulous, affirm your worth. Wow. Affirm your worth. Wow. Yeah, you do. And you have to walk in your light. Yes. If you are heavy, you know, or even if you're really thin. We're not just talking to heavy girls. We're talking about self-worth self-worth so and you know i tell people all the time it doesn't matter what you look like what size you are if god calls you to do something he will qualify you to do it when he calls you mm-hmm. you don't have to be qualified when he calls you right he qualifies you as he calls you so you still have something to offer in this life i don't care if you're 50 pounds 500 150 hey you have something to offer. You have a story that can help ignite a fire in somebody else. That's right. And so you have to be willing to be that storyteller. Exactly. And you have to share it. And it's very cathartic. You learn so much about yourself. You know, you learn now on eating habits and recognizing signs with your children. Because I'm sure that somewhere in the back of your mind, you was like, I don't want my son to go through this. I don't want him to have this low self esteem yeah. issues. You know, he's not, you know, he's not with his dad and, and his mom. How is that going to impact him? You got right. all of this negativity and this other conversation going on in your head. What did you do to really just kind of stabilize yourself so that you were able to give him the best options and choices without feeling like, you're being pushy or you're feeling like uh, this is his predestined uh, destiny that he's going to be overweight as well. Does that make sense? Yes. And and he was overweight. But what happened when I started my weight loss journey and he was watching me prepare my food and putting the little dabs on the plate and different things. And he says, mama, what are you doing? And I explained to him, I said, I'm trying to lose weight for health reasons so that I can be healthy and I can be around so I can help to raise you and to nurture you. He said, well, you know what? I'm going on the diet with you. So he did. Mm. He did. But when he said that, at that moment, I realized that I had been teaching him my bad habits because we had a routine. He had my routine. We come home and he said, mama, are we going any place today? I said, no. He go and shower, put on his pajamas. He heard his son still up outside. We both in the house ready for bed. And we would eat, watch television, and go to bed. He had my routine and I had taught him my bad habits. So when he joined this weight loss struggle with me, I was so proud. He lost weight and he has maintained the weight. Loss. Mm. Yes. He has maintained his weight loss. I mean, he's nice and slim and trim. Yes. Yeah, well, that is amazing that um, he even kind of took that suggestion from you. But what you did was also you prepared his meals. He got involved into it. Men love to cook in the kitchen. And men don't go to the doctor. They don't go to the doctor, especially black men. I don't know why. What what y'all afraid of? Science and technology is amazing. It don't hurt. Even the worst thing, a colonoscopy, they put you to sleep. Mm-hmm. 
So don't be afraid. What you should be afraid of is what you don't know. You know, again, diabetes in the people of color is running rampant. We mm-hmm. don't know what's going on with, you know, with this COVID. We got asthma. We're not ble- And then everybody's thinking that the miracle drug is weed. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I'll smoke me a joint and it'll take away my, you know, my nah. Alzheimer's. It'll take away my this, that. They don't understand that weed is being genetically modified so that it grows Thank faster. You. It grows stronger. It grows more potent. All that, all that CBD oil. Okay, you let them trick you up if you want to. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly you right. To, you know, and it make you hungry, give you the munchies, so it's no good for you. <laughs> you know, you said something very interesting about black men not going to the doctor. So I used to be a nursing instructor and I would take a group of students on Saturdays to a local barbershop in Montgomery. And we go there because it's one thing about black men. They may not go to the doctor, but they go into the barbershop. They don't get the hair, they don't get the haircut. If they don't do anything but go for the conversation, they're going. So we would set up in the barbershops and we would teach on hypertension, prostate cancer, prostate screening, diabetes, so forth. And it would be men all different ages, from little boys all the way up. And we would hit a different barbershop every week. And a lot of men really paid attention. They paid attention. And so, you know, we have to learn how, if we know that that's what's going on and the loss of our black males are affecting our families, we need to take a stand and do something to correct that. Well, corrective action, but also it's awareness. And we cannot be afraid because men are dropping like flies. I've had so many of my friends, I mean, they may have warning signs, but they don't talk about, it. oh, you know, I got a little indigestion or I keep passing a lot of gas or I keep belching. They think that it's just normal, but it's not normal. It's that not. blood pressure is going through the roof. You don't never get your sugar checked. Sugar is not extra uh, sweets. It's the body is not breaking down glucose. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's working on the pancreas and then it's de- de- destroying every uh, organ in your body amputees i've never seen so many people being amputated right now so many young people young people young people young people yes yes it's disheartening it really is but you know one thing is for me 19.2 million children in this country between the ages of 3 and 12 are obese that's too much So what are you doing to help combat that? I have joined several organizations against childhood obesity. Um, I talk about it. I speak about it. Um, I offer a boot camp for parents to teach them how to be of a better support to help that child to overcome the obesity and that struggle. I also have a boot camp for children who are obese and want to overcome that and to help them with their weight loss and how to make better food choices and how to feel good about themselves and alternatives and choices. And to know that they don't have to accept accept or suffer for less because they're overweight because they feel they're not worthy. Uh, That's not true. Mm. Just because you're overweight, you are still of worth and you still deserve the best. So you don't have to settle. Because what happens is some girls turn to promiscuity because of it, because they feel that's all they have. Well, and it's a low self-esteem, so they figure, oh, yes. nobody, nobody wants the fat girl, so let me go on and give it up, and you know, then I'm gonna find love, I'm gonna mm-hmm. find me a daddy. But no, that's not true. You gotta find that's self-love. True. You gotta that's find not true. self-love. You gotta be able to take all those clothes off and look at yourself in the mirror, and you know, figure where you tuck and roll, and love all of that first. And then work on reducing it, but reducing it at a pace that feels good to you. Do exercises that feel good to you. Everything's not at the gym. You know, I love to get on my bike. I love to go for a walk. I yes. love to dribble a basketball. Girl, I got me a hula hoop. I got some skates. All right now. Yep, I got some hey. skates. There's a lot of things that you can do and really enjoy it. So you don't have to be regimented because it's hard. You go into the gym and you see Miss Cutie Patootie. Got her lashes on, girl. I don't know why. But makeup on. Got the cutest little outfit. That's another thing. Look cute when you work out. Give yourself an incentive. 
That's don't right. Buy, you can buy cute clothes. I just had a client that was on that focuses on making leggings for big girls and they don't roll and they don't, you know, get that camel toe look. There's a lot of things that you can do to make yourself feel good about it, but want to want it. Nobody can want it for you. You can't do it for your boyfriend. You can't do it for your mama. You can't do it for other people. You can't do it for society. You have to do it for yourself. Exactly. And if you love yourself being big, be healthy and be big. At least be able to carry the groceries in the house. That's right. You know, and walk up the steps. Walk up the steps. Park a little bit further. You know, get you a body shaper and look good in them clothes. So there's a lot of options. But thank you so much, Constance, for doing what you're doing on thank every you. level. You know, thank you. sharing that with the world and really kind of just having a real relaxed conversation. We don't want to talk at you, Brains. We want to talk with you. We want to help you create solutions here on the edge. Uh, Constance, please tell my brains how to get in contact with you. They want more sure. information on childhood obesity and the books that you're in. Sure. I am on all social media, Facebook, LinkedIn at ConstanceWillard.com. On Instagram, my handle is at Anointed Educator. I also have a website, www.ConstanceWillard.com. And if you go there, you can find all about my childhood obesity, excuse me, obesity campaign. Um, you can hear about my anthology. You can see all the books that I've co-authored. You can see the magazine features and the newspaper articles that's been written about me. You can see my leadership talks, the whole nine yards. Well, I'm excited and I want them to work with you and I want them to really kind of look at what's on your children's plate and have a conversation with them about food. Have a conversation with them about how they're feeling. Have a conversation with them about how other people are treating them. Uh, do they have any friends? Pay attention to that. Where are they going? Are they going to the refrigerator? Are they going outside to dribble the basketball? Those things are important. Have a conversation with your young women about self-esteem and body image and that they yes. are beautiful no matter what and yes. who they are and that they are a queen or a king. You don't let people violate you. You don't let people use you. If you have those conversations regularly and often with your kids, you would be amazed at how things will turn around. So I need you to turn around and go and like and love this podcast, On the Edge with April Mahoney. We're on all the major social outlets. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Blog Talk, iTunes, you know, even Daddy Jeff Players. You know who Daddy Jeff is? No. <laughs> Jeff Basil from Amazon. That's what we call him now. Oh, Daddy okay. Jeff. Okay. <laughs> he the king of everything, okay? Anything. Okay. Online. So thank you so much again. And come back and visit me. Keep me informed. I'm really interested in what you do. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye, Brains. Bye.